Welcome to Parenting Today's Teens, a daily podcast that provides stories, insights, and wisdom to help you gain a deeper relationship with your teen. On today's episode, Mark Gregston answers some of your most pressing questions. Let's hear what he has to say. I was on my way back from Illinois, and I was going through a list of questions that people had given me, and um, so I decided to to divide these up a little bit and uh, try to answer four or five of them rather quickly in one way, and and yet spend enough time that uh, I can give you some good direction on these things. Here's the questions that we're going to be uh, answering today. Uh, the first question, it's really in the form of a, just a statement, tips on how to deal with a kid who doesn't seem to learn after multiple consequences. The next question is, if you give a 14-year-old girl a cell phone and then take it away because she was talking to boys she didn't know, how do you handle the situation? She wants a cell phone but doesn't want any rules. <laughs> that sounds a little familiar. Okay, here's another question. Hey, patterns and habits of communication are hard to change. How do you even start making these changes? And then they asked me the question, how do you stay so calm when a kid is pushing all your buttons? Do you ever get annoyed or angry? Uh, the answer is yes, but I'll come back to that one in just a minute. Hey, uh, here's another question. It says, what are some ways to get my child to come to me for answers instead of always going to Alexa or Google? Great, great question. Here's another one. How would you advise a mother and father who discovered a vape, a CBD, in their son's room? So anyway, those are the five questions we're going to be going through over the next 15 minutes, and hopefully I can give some uh, uh, good answers here. Okay, the first question is this, tips on how to deal with a kid who doesn't seem to learn after multiple consequences. You know, I think the first thing you have to ask is, does your child have the ability to learn? I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple question in one sense. Your child may not be able to, which means that if, if a child doesn't have internal control, then there needs to be external boundaries. Are you following me? If you don't have internal control, then you need to have external control. The whole hope is, and the desire of any parent, is that your child will develop the internal control so you don't have to always be putting up boundaries and rules to control them to get them to act appropriately. But some kids just aren't there yet. They don't have the ability to learn yet, and so that means you have to remain in some control. The other thing is 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 looking at a child's behavior. If a child continues to do things over and over and over again, you've got to ask yourself the question, why are they doing that? Now, that, that's simple, but why are they doing that? If all behavior is goal-oriented, then what are they getting out of their behavior that they're willing to risk the consequences that you've placed before them to continue to do it? And, and, and the example would be this. Let's say that uh, a child is dating somebody and, and uh, they have a significant other in their life, either a girlfriend or a boyfriend, and they are hanging out. They want to spend time with them all the time. And no matter what type of limits you put on them or restrictions, they are always getting back together, violating what you've set up. Well, you got to ask yourself that question. Why is that? Why are they, they so drawn that they would invalidate and, and break the trust with a parent knowing that there's consequences. And it usually shows the depth of their need. Um, the socializing, when a kid continues to socialize, you know, it may be that they come in an hour late from curfew and they keep doing it. And, and it's not that they're being rebellious. It's because they have such an amazing longing to socialize with other people. And, and this is especially happening right now. You know, parents look at it and say, you know, my child is being rebellious. They're not listening to me. No, 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 no. That's not all the time that it's like that. Your child has such a desire to, to, to engage with other people, his or her own age, because they're not doing it in a normal setting. And so a child will, will surely sacrifice the consequence of being late in curfew for the sake of 
being able to socialize one more hour because they are so desperate. Or it may be that they're just trying to make a connection with somebody. I mean, some of your kids are doing stupid stuff. I mean, they're drinking and getting drunk for the first time, not because they want to get drunk or, or not because they, you know, they have this propensity for alcohol or smoking pot. It's that they want to connect with a group of people that are doing that, and they're so desperate for that connection that they're willing to let go of their own values and principles and all those things that you've taught them and say, you know what, um, I'm going to do it anyway. And the next step, if you don't handle it well, what they'll do is turn around and say, well, I never believed your stuff anyway. Are you following me? It's like the smoking pot thing. Sometimes you have to look and ask the question, why is my child smoking pot? Maybe there's something wrong. Maybe they're dealing with depression. Maybe they look down upon themselves and they know they're not motivated and, and uh, this makes them tolerate themselves a little bit more. Maybe they're looking for rest. And pot will do that. It'll give you a, a little bit of a break. You get high and you forget about stuff and that's where a child feels like they get to go on vacation. You and I get to do that. We get to leave and take a break from the real world and go away and go someplace, but our kids don't. And remember this, our kids are living in a world that you and I have said that we're glad that we don't have to grow up in. And so it, you have to look at the motivation behind the behavior and then say, okay, what do we need to do? What does my child really need? And so it it it, it may not be just the consequence because that's, that's most parents – first answer is that I'll just have a bigger consequence and I'm going to let consequences then rule my home. And so a child is, all you're doing is controlling their behavior. You're not changing their behavior, really. You're just controlling it. And and I would I would tell you that that you have to control behavior if a child's not capable of picking it up on themselves and making any changes. But if you want to get to the heart of the issue, it's looking at the motivation. Then you start saying, okay, if I know that's the motivation, then how do we provide those needs to be met? Because I think it's kind of normal for a young man to want to spend time with a young lady or vice versa. I think it's normal for kids to want to socialize and greatly encouraged by me or or that they maybe want to make a connection with somebody else because they live in a culture that nobody's connecting. And so it, it's always saying is, is the motivation – for what they're doing, a genuine need that we can meet in another way, or it's taken into consideration when we come up with our rules. Okay, that being said, you still have to put together rules that have adequate consequences so you can continue to steer a child down the path that they need to walk on rather than just, you know, almost flamboyantly doing whatever they want to do uh, with a carte blanche kind of mentality that says, I can, I can do anything that I want. Because you and I know this, if they don't have the ability to get there, and there is a reason for parents in their life, then they're going to walk off the path. Remember this, that what we're trying to do is to parent our kids like God parents us. And Scripture says that, that man plans his steps, but God directs his path. And so as parents, what we want to do is direct their path and give them choices in the midst of that. All that being said, you may have to look at your consequences for the behavior that you see that you're trying to change to see if it's strong enough. Do you need to make it harder and more painful so a child realizes, if I do that, if I choose to do that, then this is the price I have to pay? And some kids go, you know what, it's, it's not. You know what, if, if I'm going to stay out an hour later and, and violate curfew, just for the sake of connecting with somebody else, is it worth losing my car for a month or having my car sold? You know, so get to get to the the core of the issue. And the second part of all this is make sure that whatever that consequence is, is that it's getting his or her attention. C.S. Lewis said that um, pain is God's megaphone to a deaf world. And sometimes a consequence that is painful and I'm not talking about just physical pain. It could be social pain. It could be, you know, isolation. It could be time out where they don't get to spend time with anybody or taking something away or limiting them or taking away some privileges or, you know, whatever it is. It's got to be strong enough to get their attention. And that's how you get a child to begin to change a little bit uh, in the way that they look at the, the, all those times that they're just not learning well, they're not learning because it's not getting their attention enough. Hope that helps. 
Hey, here's a second question. If you give a 14-year-old girl a cell phone and then take it away because she was talking to a boy she didn't know, how do you handle the situation? Okay, here, here's the thing that, that I think that a lot of parents do. So the minute a child violates a cell phone rule, we take it away. And I'm going, I think we ought to add something to it rather than taking it away all the time. She's wanting to connect with somebody. you got to look at the motivation here also and say, why is it she is needing attention from boys? Well, maybe because she's not getting attention from boys. Maybe when boys look at her, they go, ah, the only way I want to have attention with her is through texting or leaving messages. But I sure wouldn't do that on her own. And kids become something different, you know, when they're online. Um they can become more bold. They can say things they uh, wouldn't normally say. People are listening to them. They would. They would. They do stupid things as well. The girls that send inappropriate pictures of themselves to a young man just to get his attention. It's not that they're always being sexual. It just knows that a young man will look at that. So it's taking the opportunity to say, "Let's talk about these things and engage." And I'm going to continue to monitor your phone and teach you you know, what the rules are, but I'm going to train you on how, how to handle your phone. You know, she wants a cell phone, but she doesn't want the rules. Well, that's what every kid does. They don't want rules for anything. You have to put them into place and then realize that at age 14, you know, she has one set of rules. and 15, you make them a little bit more lax. At 16, a little bit more lax. All along the way with the intention of saying, I'm training her how to use this phone and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. I live with a lot of girls because I live with 60 high school kids that are so desperate in engaging with other people that they will send all sorts of pictures of themselves just to get attention. The issue isn't the picture, the issue is their motivation for intention. And I've got to ask myself the question, why aren't they getting the attention? And when we start paying attention is when they start realizing, hey, I shouldn't have done that. And so it's it's helping them understand what they're doing. But at the core of it, it's it's motivated by a longing to be valued by somebody else. Uh, you got to put some boundaries, you've got to set some rules, and you've got to let those things uh, uh, l- loosen up a little bit as they get a little bit older. Here's another question is what are some ways to get my child to come to me for answers instead of going to Alexa or Google? Okay. You know how you do that? Start speaking wisdom and quit just spouting information. Alexa, Google, Siri, they're all great sources of information. Don't be a source of information. Be a source of wisdom. And wisdom is gained by what you observe and what you reflect on and what you experience. So in certain areas of life, what have you observed? What have you reflected on or what have you experienced? You know, and and Scripture says that if you have never uh, had that wisdom, then ask God or ask other people or go to the counsel of other people. But become a fountain of wisdom. Don't become a fountain of information because of all you are are a piece of information waiting to be told to somebody else, then you will be replaced by Alexa, Google, or Siri. Here's another question that's wonderful. How would you advise a mother and father who discovered a vape in their son's room? This is what you do. You go to them and just say this. Say it outright. Hey, I was snooping around in your room, and I don't know whether the problem is that I was snooping or the problem is that I found a vape. And be honest with them. But here's the thing. If you were snooping, there's a reason you're snooping. You knew something was there. You knew something wasn't right. You knew that that something has, has gone amiss, and you've got to figure out what that is. And I would bring that up in the conversation. I knew something wasn't right, and 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 sweetheart or son, I, I just felt like I, I needed to figure something out because you're not talking to us about stuff, so I want to make sure that we're talking about this stuff. Now, if they're vaping, you think kids are going to vape? Well, sure they will. Just like a lot of kids that I knew when I went to high school and and uh, even in junior high smoked, and now they're vaping. I mean, it'll be something else in another 10 years. But my point of it is it may just be curiosity. What you don't want to do is make such a big deal that it drives your child to want to vape more because there is that sense of stress release in that. It may be that they're just trying to connect with another kids. It may be that they feel so immature they want to look more mature, and they feel like for whatever reason that makes them feel a little bit more mature. You know, 
this is where you make sure you have the discussions. You sit down and say, hey, let's talk about this. And you may apologize. I'm sorry I was snooping in your room, but I was. Um, and I've hated that I've had to do that. But I hate it more that I found a vape. Can we talk about that? And uh, and just go from there. And you know what they're going to say immediately? I mean, they're going to say, what were you doing snooping around in my room? It's because I love you, son. It's because I love you, sweetheart. And I see the path you're going on is not a good path. And I just want to help. That's it. Listen well. Be slow to speak. Be slow to anger. And you might see that your son can, can um, or your daughter, can be very truthful with you in the midst of dealing with um, why they have that vape in their room. My dad used to do this thing. He said, if you, I find any cigarettes, you get to eat them. <laughs> so tell me, if you catch him again with a vape, he's going to have to eat the vape. No, I'm joking with you. I'm not, I don't mean that at all. Hey, here's another question. It's patterns and habits of communication are hard to change. How do you even start making those? You know what? You stop doing what's not working and you start doing something else. It doesn't mean what you're doing is wrong. It just means it's not effective. If if you communicate in an angry way or, or you're always communicating in lecture or, or when you speak, you're always kind of throwing out a sense of judgment in your comments, especially when you use you know, Scripture to back it up, then nobody can argue against that because God said that. You know, or there's a sense of a kind of a, you know, where you're demeaning or uh, or have yourself raised above your child just a little bit, that you're speaking down to them. Or they feel like they're being shamed in the process. You have to begin to understand how your child is interpreting what you're saying. And once you begin to understand how they interpret what you say, and I would ask them, hey, do I shame you when I make comments? Do you feel like I'm judgmental? Do you feel like I'm demanding you to be perfect? Do you feel like um, I'm speaking down to you all the time? Do you feel like I lecture too much? Do you feel like I'm always correcting you all the time? You know, there's something about that 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 just says, I want to do something different here. When you ask the question, your child will tell you. And then let them know. I want you to know I don't want to be like that. I want us to be able to have discussions about things. Now, if you're always telling your child that they're wrong, then quit because it doesn't do any good. If you want to have a discussion, you know, your words over a period of time, coupled with the blameless life that you live before your child, full of imperfections, but genuine and authentic, will speak volumes to your child, and it'll change the way you communicate. Here's one of the problems is you're, you're holding on to this communication style that you have to speak words all the time, and quite honestly, it's probably one of the most least effective ways of communicating. It's how we engage not only in word, but in deed as well. How we engage with them, how we love them, how we listen to them makes all the difference. So somebody says, how do you stay calm when a kid is pushing your buttons? Well, I know this. I know that they're pushing my buttons for a reason, and it's to rile me up for some reason because they want my attention. So I make sure that I give them my attention before they start pushing my buttons. And it says, do you ever get angry? Well, sure I do. But the moment that I get angry in a conversation, you know what I've realized? If anger is an emotional response to not getting what you want, what I realize is when I get angry as a parent, you know, at my child, it's because I'm not getting what I want. And and this is what happens. When Scripture says, consider others more important than yourself, don't look, don't merely look after your own interest. What that is saying is that is that your child needs your total focus right now. And it's not about you. It's not about you at all. It's about your child. So when you start to get angry, what's happened is you just shifted everything to yourself, and now it is about you because your child isn't behaving or they're not understanding or they're not valuing what you say or they're not following your principles or they don't agree with you. You know what? I've given up on that a long time ago with kids. They can position themselves anyway, and what I've learned is over a period of time 
is that my values will be transferred them, not just by word. I've spent the first 12 years of their life trying to communicate that to them. Now it's going to be the example that I set before them and what they see and how I engage with people that makes it attractive enough that they say, you know what? I want something just like that. Hey, I hope this helps. You know, I, I, I spend a lot of time in a, in a book called Raising Teens in a Contrary Culture. I wrote it a couple of years ago. I dedicated it to my dog, Stitch, who is no longer with us, but I get to see her every time I open the book. And, and I always go back to this book because it talks about communication styles and how to engage differently with kids. I put a lot of time into it, and, and uh, it's probably one of my favorite books. And we also made it into a curriculum series that can be used for you know small groups or life groups or Sunday school groups, whatever you call them. But it's a wonderful book. It's called Raising Teens in a Contrary Culture. Uh, came out a couple of years ago. But if you're having problems with communication or you want to learn how to just communicate differently, this would be a great book for you. Hey, I hope you have a, a great week this week. I hope the answers to some of these questions are, are hitting the nail on the head for you. Look forward to talking to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Parenting Today's Teens. For more information, visit parentingtodaysteens.org. And to learn more about Heartlight, visit heartlightministries.org. If this podcast has been helpful in your life and family, please share it or give us a quick rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Of course, you can listen to Parenting Today's Teens wherever you listen to podcasts. Join us back here on Monday for another great episode. We'll talk to you then.